Hello and welcome to Healthcare IT Today, where we explore the latest trends and interesting stories in health IT. Today on the program, we are going to explore the regulation of AI in healthcare. Is it going to happen? And what form is it going to take? I'm going to sit down with Caleb Williamson from the Connected Health Initiative, and he's going to give me the inside scoop as to what's happening in the halls of government regarding AI and healthcare. I think you'll find this conversation super interesting and super relevant. Let's get to it. Hello, Caleb. It's great to have you on the program. Hi. Hi, Colin. I'm excited to be here. It's going to be a great day. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. But before we dive into the topic at hand, for our audience, can you give us an introduction of yourself and tell us a little bit about your role and your very unique organization? Absolutely. So my name is Caleb Williamson. I'm State Public Policy Counsel with the Connected Health Initiative. Uh, the Connected Health Initiative is a an advocacy group that is comprised of what we like to believe is one of the most holistic views of the healthcare ecosystem. So we are an, an organization that advocates on behalf and with uh, patient groups, pharmaceutical companies, large and small tech companies, academic medical centers, you name it. You know, we run across the entire ecosystem. And what's unique about us is that when we get engaged on a topic, this isn't just an issue that, you know, patient groups care about. This isn't an issue that solely, you know, pharmaceutical companies care about. This is a group that our advocacy is rooted in consensus. So when we get involved on an issue or when we're diving into a new subject, the entire ecosystem that we have access to has agreed that this is something that warrants us getting involved with. And for a little bit background on me, I am State Public Policy Council here at the Connected Health Initiative. Prior to my time here, I served with the New York State Senate as in council's office, uh, providing guidance under some amazing leaders. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't you know, name drop them, but under the leadership of uh, the then majority council, Chantel Smith, uh, my direct supervisor, Tamara Frazier, as well as uh, some of the deputies, uh, Lonnie Three and Eric Katz, all, all of whom are phenomenal and, and incredible individuals. Um, but while I was with the New York State Senate, I worked very closely with the Committees on Health and Human Services. And so, you know, it just seemed like a natural progression to then want to look at opportunities to continuously advocate and pick a side and lean in. Um, while simultaneously uh, sticking and jumping into what I felt would be the future of, of health policy, which is tech health, the intersection of technology and health policy. I think, Caleb, it's, it's safe to say you have the, your hand on the pulse of what's happening uh, in the uh, halls of government when it comes to technology, healthcare, healthcare policy, and so forth. And you're advocating on behalf of a lot of the members who actually listen and watch this podcast. Absolutely. We definitely do. And, and, you know, in the course of my role, I am the person who is rubbing elbows with state legislators across the country. My portfolio includes the entire country. And so definitely keeping my ear to the ground and even at times having my boots on the ground or really dress shoes on the ground to, to really understand and see how states are thinking about uh, artificial intelligence, how they're thinking about anything that uh, involves the intersection of health and technology. Well, and that brings us to the topic at hand. So the reason why I'm excited to get together with you uh, is because of artificial intelligence. It is, you know, the hot topic of the moment. Everyone's talking about how to deploy it, what it is, where it's useful, particularly in healthcare. And, you know, over the last 12 months, you know, there's one question that's been bubbling under. Do you think the government is actually going to get involved in regulating AI Absolutely. And, and very candidly, there is there's almost a twofold approach, a twofold approach to 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 those points you just raised. And the first uh, the first point is really about data privacy and patient privacy. We have seen a plethora of health bills and privacy bills, really. And that seems to be everything that kind of is the uh, 
the most important factor when you're talking about the use of artificial intelligence. Data drives decision making, whether that be with an individual or autonomous, which is also a factor that or or one avenue where artificial intelligence can be useful, especially in the healthcare sector. And so when we're talking about, you know, involvement. Now, last year we saw over at the state level, we saw over 200 um, data privacy bills introduced. And most of them had some section that touched on health privacy. We also saw some standalone health privacy bills as well. Um, but now when we're talking about artificial intelligence, what's very interesting is that some of the agencies and governments at the state level, um, you know, they're starting to create task forces because they're recognizing that there is a learning curve. And I think there's been a growing interest in preventing legislation from not being future proof. I think one of the most important things and important roles for a state legislator or for any legislator for that matter is to make sure that you have legislation that does not die when times change or it does not die when there's new innovation and new technologies coming down the pike. And so one of the best tools and one of the best pieces of legislation that we've seen coming out of coming down the pike has been legislators really um being quite honest with themselves and with their with their larger constituents saying hey listen there's a knowledge gap here we want to be quick to learn but slow to regulate and that's in a and that's a, a philosophy that that i i believe is the most thoughtful and the most uh important when, when it comes to regulating something that has taken the world by storm, which is the use of artificial intelligence. However, I do also want to point out that legislators in these working groups, in these task forces, when they're meeting with stakeholder groups and when they're meeting with individuals, they recognize and they we have to constantly remind them that artificial intelligence is not new. You know, our understanding of how it's been utilized or the access to it by the general public may be a little bit more new. However, the use of it by various organizations, various companies, small businesses, large businesses, hospital systems, medical systems, and, and schools, it has been around for a very long time. And so these focus groups and working groups and study commissions, I think, are the best ways that we've been seeing states admit that they want to engage, but they want to make sure that they do so in a thoughtful manner. I think no, no state wants to be the, uh, the poster child of a bad piece of legislation. And I don't think any federal legislator wants to be the poster uh, child of bad piece of legislation that pertains to the use of artificial intelligence in healthcare. And especially when there are elections coming up, I think everyone is bringing a heightened level of, uh, of thoughtfulness to the to the fold, but we've also seen some outright attempts to prohibit the use of artificial intelligence. There, there's a bill out of the state of Georgia that is aiming to prohibit the use of artificial intelligence in the absence of meaningful, meaningful human review. Um, but there's no definition of what meaningful human review is. And, and, you know, and there are some, some other concerns with the bill because it does not uh, create a risk-based approach, doesn't talk about high risk versus low risk uses of artificial intelligence, all of which the healthcare community has completely understood and employed. And so I think there is still an opportunity for us and the country and regulators to really find uh, a, a medium, a middle ground where they can learn, we can share the use cases that we have access to, and ultimately thoughtful legislation, if it's warranted, uh, could be created. Wow, lots to unpack there, uh, Caleb, but you know, <laughs> took my couple of takeaways from that. You know, it's encouraging to hear that uh, government entities are trying to be honest with themselves and admit that there's this knowledge gap and they're creating task forces to try and bridge that gap, to learn more. Uh, and they're they're being cautious and uh, slow to regulate, um, rather than trying to rush in here. Um, I take that to mean that they're not feeling a big push to regulate AI at the moment. Like it doesn't, from what you just said, it doesn't sound like there's this like big pressure that oh by the summer I have to have something in here. There doesn't seem to be that 
maybe a public outcry or anything as of yet to really force the hand of the of the legislators. So that's why they are giving themselves the time to learn. It, would that be a fair statement? I think for for some legislators, it would be a fair statement. I think for other legislators, and you know, we have to also remember the the various role that movies have played in our understanding of artificial intelligence. And I think about movies like iRobot and things of that sort, where <laughs> where there are a lot of legislators who operate just with a with a fear of the use of the unknown. And so, you know, while there are a lot of bills that are focusing on creating task forces that are supposed to learn about the various uses of artificial intelligence, there are some some proposals out there that are really a direct result of the fear of the unknown, not just embracing the unknown as a as a beacon of hope, but there are rational fears associated with, with um, artificial intelligence and as manifested through some of the proposals that we've seen and even through some of the conversations that we've had with the task forces. So so let's play a little bit of a of a game, Caleb. Like if a if if a government entity, whether state or federal, was to get involved in the regulating or putting up these guardrails for AI's use in healthcare, what do you think that might look like? What 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 are some of those parameters that they might put uh, or tackle in a, legis a piece of legislation? I think one of the areas that they would definitely have to uh, include some guardrails in and what a guardrail would look like is creating commissions that will explore, further explore all the uses of artificial intelligence in healthcare. And all is very sweeping. I know that's very tedious and you know commissions take resources, time and money. But I think it's important to think about that primarily because we need to make sure that there is a uniform body of legislation that can come out that understands what high risk uses of artificial intelligence in healthcare looks like, what are moderate uses and what are low, low risk. And, and I, I say that because, you know, what may be considered a high risk in one state, another place may say, Hey, listen, Oh, we do that every day. That's, we don't need, we don't need review of that. We, we at the CHI, we do not deny the importance of having human intervention and human oversight, but we want to make sure that it's not warranted for every step of the process where artificial intelligence has been created to expedite our, our ability to, to increase the quality of care shared with patients. I would say most importantly, um, we do not want to see a patchwork of of bills and regulations that are flooding the country. We're seeing that currently with data privacy, and as mentioned earlier, privacy and data drives decision-making. And so when we have 50 different privacy bills, well, right now we have 15, but when, <laughs> as we see more different privacy bills take full, this is gonna become even more onerous and burdensome on not only hospital systems, but marketers who are trying to increase their clientele on developers who are building the new technologies. And we want to make sure that we're not going to limit and stifle the use of technological advancement in healthcare innovations because we we can't have something that is uniform. If I'm a vendor listening or watching this and I use AI or maybe I make the AI that other people use uh, in their products, how can I get involved here? Like what, what, how can I get involved with CHI? What, in, in, Besides that, how do I just get involved in helping to shape regulation across the country? Yeah, absolutely. So first, I'll start with CHI because I love them so much. But um, one of the main best ways to get involved is to go to our website, look at our resources. And also, if you're interested, and I hope everyone who watches is interested in getting engaged, to, to check out our website, which is uh, connectedhi.com. And, you know, even there, we have a list of resources. We have publications that we still to this day circulate as well. And ultimately, if you are building something, if you are utilizing artificial intelligence in some way, shape or form, there are some there are some resources as well that you may be able to tap into there. I know if it's helpful, there there is a company called Plural Policy that has a free version of a legislative tracking tool. 
And that is a great way to, you know, play around and see what proposals are coming out of the states as well. I will say that, you know, knowing what's coming down the pike is very different than engaging on it. And that's where I think CHI really, really is the meat and potatoes for all of that kind of work. But I would say that staying in the know is your best friend and recognize that early investment in in your your company's ability to advocate is the dividends and the returns are going to be so much higher than compliance costs in the, in the event that you know one chooses to sit on the sidelines and just wait until it is a problem so being proactive getting involved with the CHI and utilizing resources like floral policy and things of that sort those are all avenues that can really help anyone who is interested in making sure that they're protected and that they know what's coming down the pike. Yeah, I'm going to assume getting involved with CHI can take many different forms. There's lots of different ways that people can get involved, but maybe in a short um, response, can you give us an idea of what getting involved as opposed to consuming just your content? What does getting involved with CHI look like or feel like? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a steering committee that folks can join and that that group that I say that we advocate on behalf of that's comprised of the ecosystem, that is our steering committee. And they come to us with problems, with issues. We circulate it to the broader membership or the broader uh, committee. And we say, hey, is anyone else seeing this? Does anyone else have concerns, thoughts, anything? And you know, one of the best resources that I can say about our, our committee in joining that is that we have monthly calls where we provide a robust robust update from what's happening on the federal level at the agency level across the states what are the upcoming meetings if those are if there are any meetings that folks would like to to join in on they're more than welcome to so we provide kind of like a i don't know i don't know how to say this any better but like a one stop shop for hearing about what the newest uh, updates are based on our internal relationships with governments, with agencies, with legislators, with governors, you name it, just really providing that that real raw off the record update about what's happening in the space. And then also leveraging the stories of the various constituents that our steering committee members service, and even the stories of them themselves. Um, stories carry a lot of weight, especially in, um, especially in proactive advocacy. I love it. So for those that are interested, Caleb, where can they go again to, to, to learn more and maybe get involved in the steering committee? Sure. Uh, to learn more and, and to find out how to get involved with our steering committee, our website is connectedhi.com. And all the information is there. And we hope that you join. Oh, well, excellent. Well, Caleb, this has been fantastic. Thank you for sharing uh, some of the insider knowledge that you have on what's happening with legislation, regulation in AI and healthcare. I really do appreciate that and definitely appreciate your perspective on what form that regulation may take uh, and obviously your advocacy in terms of trying to get more voices to, to raise the profile of healthcare and health IT within the halls of government. Absolutely. And thank you for having me, Colin. Really appreciate your time, Caleb. Take it easy. All right. Thank you. Hey, I want to thank Caleb for coming on camera with me and giving us that insider look at what potentially might be happening around legislation and regulation when it comes to the use of AI in healthcare. My key takeaway is, regardless of whether or not you think the government should or shouldn't get involved, the point is that they're considering it. And we as an industry need to get together and perhaps help shape what form that regulation and that legislation will take. And getting involved with a, an organization like CHI or getting involved locally with your chapter of, of HIMSS or your local IT or your local association, all of that can be very, very helpful. That is my key takeaway. And hey, if you enjoyed this interview as much as I did, please like and subscribe. Also, head on over to healthcareittoday.com where you can find more great content like this. I'm Colin Hung, and I'll catch you on the next episode.